on the National Geographic Channel. A treasure-laden Japanese submarine is sunk by U.S. warplanes. Decades later, modern-day adventurers hope to find her and her gold. Join their search for the submarine I-52. Now on Mysteries of the Deep. Kure, Japan, a coastal city that for almost a hundred years has been the base for Japanese naval submarines. In a strange way, the life of Paul Tidwell has become centered here. Tidwell is an American treasure hunter who seems to enjoy being an elusive and somewhat mysterious figure. He has spent years trying to discover the fate of ships that have sunk while carrying secret and highly valuable cargo. One of these was a giant submarine that left here late in World War II. And so began a grim and fateful story that continues to this day. Adolf Hitler had long believed that Nazi Germany could dominate the world all by itself. But as World War II widened, Germany needed allies. So Japanese diplomats were greeted with well-orchestrated enthusiasm in Berlin. Germany, Japan, and Italy had joined forces to become the so-called Axis powers. Few allies have ever had such grandiose ambitions, and few have been physically so far apart. The entire continent of Asia, all of the Soviet Union, lay between the Germans and the Japanese. Over 4,000 miles of the Trans-Siberian Railway was the only direct link between them. Japan had been at war with China since 1937 and had set its sights on all of Southeast Asia. The prize was raw materials, essential for further conquest. There was tungsten and tin, opium to quench the pain of wounded soldiers, and rubber that could help keep the Axis offensive rolling. For a time, much of this material found its way across neutral Russia to Germany. Then, in a move that stunned the world, Hitler's war machine suddenly turned on the Soviets. If the Nazis could overwhelm the Russians, they would restore the link with Japan and together dominate more than half of the Northern Hemisphere. But by the summer of 1942, the Soviets were still unbroken, and the only practical trade route was by sea. Over 14,000 miles through waters increasingly dominated by the Western Allies. At first, German merchant vessels attempted to run the Allied blockade by stealth or by pretending to be from neutral nations. But more and more were intercepted and destroyed as the war went on. Eventually, losses were so severe that blockade running by surface ships was abandoned. To make the voyage safely, Germany and Japan turned to submarines. The Japanese specialized in huge submarines. Compared to most German U-boats, they were gigantic. Over a hundred feet longer, a thousand tons heavier, with twice the crew. Some of the large Japanese submarines could make the entire trip without refueling. Proving this epic voyage was possible, a Japanese submarine had reached port in Nazi-occupied France in August 1942. As bands played, the Japanese sailors were given a hero's welcome. They were greeted by high-ranking German officers, 
and lavish parties were given in their honor. Much was at stake. In return for raw materials, Japan shared sophisticated German technology, including jet engines and advanced radar. In Berlin, Japanese ambassador Oshima Hiroshi was doing all he could to bolster the Axis alliance. He was a trusted confidant of Hitler and often knew German plans at their inception. Using coded radio transmissions, Oshima's staff exchanged detailed reports on the blockade runners with Tokyo. But these reports were also intercepted and deciphered by Allied intelligence. Key Axis codes had been broken. By the end of the war, virtually all Axis radio traffic could be decoded. After the war, these intercepted messages remained in secret archives and would not be accessible for more than 40 years. In 1990, Paul Tidwell began his research in Washington, D.C. A Vietnam veteran with a Purple Heart and two Bronze Stars for Valor, Tidwell was deeply troubled by his wartime experiences. It took him 10 years to overcome his nightmares. What brought Tidwell to the National Archives was a wealth of recently declassified documents telling the secret history of World War II. There were intelligence reports, ship's logbooks, and perhaps the most important to Tidwell, decoded enemy radio messages, preserved here word for word. It was hard, turning over thousands of pieces of paper, looking for clues, literally the breadcrumbs of World War II, putting those kind of things together. And one day, Tidwell began a voyage into the past. It began with the cryptic name I-52. Tidwell read that I-52 left Japan in March 1944, bound for Nazi-occupied France with a stop in Singapore. In addition to almost 300 metric tons of cargo, there were 95 crewmen and 14 technicians being sent to Germany to study technology that they would bring back to Japan. Their families were never told where they were going. The sub was stuffed with war supplies, 2.8 tons of opium and 54 tons of rubber, all carefully detailed in the documents Tidwell was reading. I was going through documents I'd never seen before. I really didn't know where it was going to take me. And then one day, I flipped the page, and there it was. It was a note that an intelligence officer had typed in, and that note disclosed that I-52 had two tons of gold on it. That moment, I put that page down, looked around to see if anybody was looking at me, quite common people try to find out what you're doing I took a deep breath and I kept going I kept trying to find other details about I-52 it was I-52's maiden voyage a trip halfway around the world that would take months I-52's crew endured long days and nights of boredom and anxiety all day, when submerged, they had to lie motionless to conserve precious oxygen. I-52 safely crossed the Indian Ocean and rounded the Cape of Good Hope. Her progress was being followed by naval high commands in Tokyo, Berlin, and in Washington, D.C. Everything was known by the Allies, who even had the names and professional qualifications of I-52 civilian passengers. I-52 rounded Africa only a few weeks before the Allied invasion of France on D-Day. Time was running out for the Nazis as they faced a full-scale assault from the Normandy beachhead. 150 miles to the southwest, at the Nazi-occupied port of Lorient, a shipment of strategic war supplies waited for I-52. 
They were radar units, bomb sites, and quite possibly uranium oxide to be used in Japanese research on atomic weapons. The manifest shows 500 kilograms of a substance that was not precisely identified. In Washington, an ambush was being planned. It was learned that I-52 intended to rendezvous with a German submarine to take on a pilot and radar equipment. The rendezvous point was far from land, out of range of Allied shore-based aircraft. But the Allies had a new weapon, the so-called Baby Flattop, a small aircraft carrier built on the hull of a merchant ship. These ships and their planes were wreaking havoc with the German U-boats. They could strike unsuspecting submarines far at sea. Yes, Next, Tidwell and his team scour the ocean floor for traces of I-52. The submarine is not there. Will they find her? The answer when Mysteries of the Deep returns. We now return to search for the submarine I-52. On the night of June 23rd, 1944, the German submarine U-530 surfaced to meet the Japanese. A small boat transferred three Germans and radar equipment to I-52. Two submarines parted. I-52 remained on the surface. About an hour later, it was attacked by planes from the carrier USS Bogue and sunk near latitude 40 north, longitude 15 west. Sunk with its 112 men, nearly 200 tons of cargo, and its two tons of gold. April 1995, Tidwell charters a former Soviet oceanographic ship and sails to the point in the mid-Atlantic where I-52 is believed to have sunk. Lowered on a cable, side-scan sonar reveals the ocean bottom over three miles below. But for almost two weeks, this painstaking survey continues day and night without a trace of I-52. I would stay up, pitching in on both shifts, getting very little sleep, and I've never been through this much stress, I don't think, in my life. Uh, you know, you look, and you just, sometimes you just think, what am I doing out here in the middle of nowhere looking for I-52? There are many unknowns. What's left of I-52 after so long? What would it look like on sonar? These are the areas that we've covered so far, correct? Okay. Finally, with time running out, Tidwell's expert survey team recommends extending the search into a new area. Please sketch in what we've covered so far. Their computer analysis places I-52 over 10 miles from the original estimated position. line we're on right now to finish off. For Tidwell, it's the last okay, chance. We are fairly certain in what we've looked at so far in this 56 square miles or so. The submarine is not there. At this point, I am looking at my whole life changing for the worse. Because if we don't find it, then there's all this money out there. There's been a lot of disappointed people. But I had to pick myself up and say, hey, it's, it's worth the struggle. And the fight's not over until it's over. Uh, we're on this last line. I, I informed the survey team that after we completed this line, we were to turn the ship around and head back uh, to Barbados. In the last hours, they find it. I-52 lies within a half mile of the position computers predicted, correcting errors made by the original navigators in 1944. Now, a video camera is towed over the site, and human eyes scan a landscape hidden in darkness for millions of years. First, there's scattered debris. 
Then, larger objects, torn apart by terrific force. Finally, the camera scans a portion of a huge metal hull and catches a telltale image. A steel propeller guard at the stern, used only by Japanese submarines. The search is over. The salvage effort begins. One system well suited to survey the wreck is the Russian research vessel Akademik Mstislav Keldish and her twin man submersibles, the Mirs. The product of expensive Cold War technology, the Mirs are now available to the West. But they are expensive, and it is three years before Tidwell can raise the money needed to charter the Mirs and return to I-52. Jim Philippone has made it possible, investing over $2 million. A lawyer from Rochester, New York, Philippone has reached an uneasy agreement with Tidwell. My motivation for doing it was first and foremost uh, for the excitement and the history. But profit was by no means a small part of this. If Paul is right, there's $20 million worth of gold on the bottom of the ocean, and I sure would like to have it. And Paul and I have an agreement where we're going to make a, where it's going to be advantageous for both of us. I put up the money for the trip, he puts up the expertise, and we're partners. And I'm looking forward to that. November 8th, 1998. The Keldish departs Las Palmas in the Canary Islands. The expedition is not equipped to look for gold inside the wreck of I-52. But this may not be necessary. Tidwell has photos that show suspicious objects lying in plain sight in the debris field. All right, now this is the debris field of which these photographs were taken. And these particular photographs, each photograph contains at least one ingot. Right across here is the camera pass that took these photos now. If I understand you right, then you can go right to where that is and you can tell me if that's going to be a gold bar or not or if it's metal or tin or some other kind. That's right. We, what we'll do is we, we refine, relocate this, get to where these ingots are and pick it up. So you're going to go back, you're going to go back in here where you found that pass? Exactly. Where you took these? Yeah. A lot of people think it's about two tons of gold. Maybe at first it was. That was pretty exciting for me too. But later, it wasn't about gold at all. It was about the story and history and uncovering something that no one else knew about and also helping create a new history, something that we can discover with other people and share. And that really became very important to me personally. As part of his research, Tidwell has contacted veterans of VC-69, the U.S. Naval Attack Squadron credited with sinking I-52. Now, three World War II veterans are coming on the expedition. Examining the wreck may clarify what actually happened that night 54 years ago. Then, none of them knew much about the Japanese submarine or the importance of sinking her. Coming up, the dives begin. What remains of I-52? Tell us what you see. We are in the debris field. Find out when Mysteries of the Deep continues. Search for the submarine I-52 continues. At times, the expedition seems like a holiday cruise. There are two film crews, a National Geographic photographer and writer, and to general mystification, two former Navy SEAL security guards hired by Tidwell to protect I-52's cargo from persons unknown. Tidwell has also brought four technical experts who will work closely with the Russians for whom the trip is fairly routine. Much hope and anxiety centers on a high-resolution camera Tidwell has supplied. The Russians have carefully tested its housing. If it should implode three miles down, it could cause a disaster. Finally, everything checks out. 
and meets with the approval of Anatoly Saglievich, director of the Mir Submersibles program. November 20th, they have finally reached their goal. A lonely spot in the Atlantic Ocean, some 1,500 miles from the coast of West Africa. Well, we're here, <laughs> finally. Three miles to go, straight down. The U.S. Navy veterans never expected to find themselves on this watery battlefield once again. This was really uh, the first time that you realize that uh, this thing was really down there and uh, happened that night and it never went anywhere else. Being here at this spot reminded me of my former shipmates on the carrier. Caused me to think uh, a lot about them, uh, especially the ones that are no longer with us. Am I glad that I came? I wouldn't have missed this for the world. This is the greatest thing since World War II that has happened to me, and a lot of things have happened. But this is just great. This scene of battle, a secret for decades, is something of a mystery even now. Different people have come here for different reasons. They all want to know more of what happened here. But this raises deep-seated emotions in the veterans. Pride and remorse, remembered anger and fear. We do this out of respect, not only for the men who died on this submarine, but for all people who've died in war. Whether it was our former enemies or allies, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Not now. So with that in mind, I think we should offer up this wreath and maybe to ourselves say a silent prayer. The next day, Mir One will be the first sub down. Anatoly Saglievich is a conspicuous and popular figure. At Union, he has scrambled to keep the mirrors in service, combining science with show business. Appearing in the movie Titanic has made the mirrors famous, but it's still hard work to keep them busy. Ready? To the bottom. This will be Tidwell's first experience in a deep diving submersible. The three men will be confined here for some 16 hours. Anyone with even a mild tendency toward claustrophobia is not encouraged to enter the mirrors. It will take about four hours for the mirrors to descend three miles. To conserve power, they are simply allowed to fall slowly into the abyss. It's been a long road for Tidwell and the others. And now these hours seem endless especially for Paul's wife, Joanne. As the mirrors descend deeper and deeper, the distance between the subs and the surface seems vast and terrifying. No one can forget what happened here to the men of I-52. More than anything, sheer tenacity has brought Paul Tidwell here. Confiding fully in no one, he has picked his way through a legal, financial, and technical maze to arrive at this tense and lonely moment. Miles beneath the sea. 
They are now as deep as Titanic, just over two miles with another mile to go. Over 5,000 meters, it is near freezing. The ocean bottom should appear at any moment. There is nothing to be seen but featureless mud. And then, incredibly, a few small fish. Then, bits and pieces of machinery and a metal box that demands to be reported. Tell us what you see. We're not on I-52 yet. We are in her debris field. However, we see boxes all over the place, and we may cover some of them right now. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Do that. Do yes. Yeah. 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 That's good. Yeah. 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 Further examination must wait until they return to the surface. They move on towards I-52. The submarine is at first unrecognizable. Its bow has been torn off, revealing a tangled mass of pipes and wires. Then the forward deck. Much of the wooden decking is still in place. Another great wound in the hull just forward of the conning tower with a hatchway still intact and open. Towards the stern, there's further damage. This huge wound breached the pressure hull, sending the great vessel and its 112 passengers and crew screaming into the deep. Towards the stern, the hull is intact, with its distinctive tail fin and the propeller guards that first identified the wreck. Miles above, the U.S. Navy veterans will match the wreckage with their memories. We got there a couple days before the interception, and we flew night and day all around the clock. I think we never made any contact at all. Until then, on the night of the 23rd, they sent four planes out, I think, at around 9 o'clock at night. The pilots were weary. They'd been seven weeks at sea. First out was Lieutenant Commander Jesse Taylor, commander of Squadron 69. I think our takeoff was uh, maybe 23.30, 11.30 p.m., somewhere in there, before midnight. And we were, had probably been airborne an hour to an hour and a half when Ed Whitlock, who was the radio operator, got on the intercom and told me he had a blip on his radar screen, so we homed in. And we dropped the parachute flares, which spotted him. Depth charges exploded just forward of the conning tower as I-52 was diving. The hit was grave, but not fatal. The Japanese still had a chance. Taylor then dropped a sono buoy, a floating sonar receiver that would radio the sound of I-52's propellers to his plane overhead. Sounds of the battle were captured on an early wire recorder. The recorder and the acoustic homing torpedo Taylor dropped next were all new U.S. weapons. 
In quest of new technology, the technicians on I-52 became its victims. A huge explosion was heard. But an hour later, a second plane piloted by 23-year-old Bill Gordon arrived to make sure of the kill. All of a sudden, we began to pick up the solder boys from the pattern that had been laid before by Skipper Jesse Taylor. So after about an hour out there trying to figure out what we were going to do, I said to the crew that I thought we'd better drop our acoustic torpedo, which was tuned to the propeller beats of the submarine, and it would search it out. And at 21 minutes, there was a tremendous roar in the hydrophones on all stations. And that uh, roar lasted for 58 seconds. The following day, a large oil slick marked the site of battle, and U.S. warships collected over 3,000 pounds of raw rubber from the sea, together with a sandal, pieces of silk, and human flesh. Up next, the hunt for I-52's gold continues with some promising clues. And maybe we're going to get the recovery of the gold after all. Will they find the gold? Search for the submarine I-52 will return. We now return to search for the submarine I-52. After years of hard work and planning, Paul Tidwell enjoys his close encounter with I-52. Working together, the two mirrors can light up and photograph I-52 far more effectively than a single submersible. On the conning tower, they find a funnel-like radar apparatus designed to detect ships on the surface. It could not save I-52. Close examination reveals fascinating details. Guns still loaded, but their threat now muted by delicate sea anemones. It is soon apparent that if the gold is still inside I-52, it will be impossible to reach without special equipment. Hours spent exploring here seem like minutes. This is truly a place where time stands still. It takes another four hours to reach the surface, and only a party of night owls is on hand to greet the I-52 explorers. After 16 hours in the cramped submarine and emotions that have run the gamut from fear to exultation, Tidwell is a little at a loss for words. Ooh, I should say it. It is unbelievable. Yeah, it sounds, sounds good. yeah I got flipped over. This is, it was great. Was it great? You just can't imagine. You tired? Oh, no, I'm fine. No, I'm fine. Anatoly says, or Marco says, Anatoly pulled right into it. Yeah. Did you get the picture? Right into the part, one part of it on the side. That's from his world. Now the metal box will be spirited away and opened in private by Tidwell's security guards. Uh, Tidwell later reports that it contains opium, but the unexplained secrecy leaves many on the expedition baffled and upset. In the days that follow, three more dives are made by both submersibles. The large debris field is searched and mapped. But the sonar location system that allows precise navigation is not always working. And several observers on the dives are novices. 
Everyone hopes to be the first to catch the glimpse of gold, and there is no shortage of ideas about where to look. Bars of tin litter the bottom. Time and again, hopes are raised and dashed when they are closely examined. Got a man with a plan. Every night after the dive, recovered objects are eagerly inspected. A number of metal boxes are chiseled open. They contain little more than seawater and sediment. No one can say exactly what this is, but one thing is sure, it is not gold. At $25,000 a dive, Philippone is getting nervous. The following day, in a meeting to review progress, National Geographic writer Preet Veseland reports that on his dive, he has seen something new. As we turned and came here, there was the large de debris field and included what looked like a big gun. There were clear ingots that looked like what we now know to be tin. Every five to ten feet, there was something else. The trouble was that we never came back because we ran out of power because we had exhausted a lot of power when we first got down there. You found something that may be significant for us. To I need to ask a question. Preet, you said that you, that you saw, that what you saw uh, looked like pieces of metal that came out of the side of the ship. Yeah. Yes, it was definitely no. bent metal that had rivets on it that looked like the armor or the outside or, in the, or the inside of a ship. So that must have been where the bigger explosion came and spewed it in an arc into this field here. Good luck, buddy! As Tidwell makes the next dive, Philippone's hopes soar. First, you're going to recover the gold, and boy, you feel it in your fingers. And then all of a sudden, your fingers aren't feeling it anymore. And you say to yourself, well, you know, where am I going with this? And then after four dives, uh, there's no gold. It looks like we've exhausted the debris field. And then yesterday, for the first time, we find another debris field. And this debris field has all of the markings of a gold bar, or of several gold bars. So now we're in a position where things are beginning to feel good again, and maybe we're going to get the recovery of the gold after all. But in a miscommunication that will lead to bitterness and rancor, the Mears will not search for the new debris field today. Tidwell's plan is to raise a Japanese flag on I-52's deck to honor her dead. Forged, perhaps, in his memories of Vietnam, he is determined to complete this symbolic act. It takes more than an hour of precious dive time. Welcome to the house of the rising sun. But while working on I-52's deck, the Mears make a thrilling discovery. Underneath the decking is a solid layer of metal ingots. This was part of I-52's wet cargo, stowed outside to increase her cargo capacity. Underwater, they gleam enticingly. But the ingots are tin, not gold. Near the end of the dive, they recover a shoe. It's a hint of what may remain sealed inside I-52. Ceramics, glassware, and sometimes even paper can be well preserved even after decades in the deep sea. Next, personalities clash and disagreements arise as the gold remains elusive. The investor for this project pulled the rug out from under me when search for submarine I-52 returns. Now, the conclusion of search for the submarine I-52. 
Tidwell returns from dive number five. And look, gold down and down there. We found hundreds, hundreds. What is that? Probably, yeah, there's probably a million dollars or so in tin down there. The large quantity of tin may be worth a lot of money, but it would take weeks to salvage it, and it would certainly not be a paying proposition. The next day, the expedition explodes into acrimony. It is announced that Tidwell is no longer in charge of operations. He has become a mere spectator. When I came up from my fifth dive with what I thought was going to be some really great news, I was hit in the face with uh, the investor for this project, pulled the rug out from under me, said, I'm going to control the next dive. I'm going to put in who I want to put in, and they're going to go where I tell them to go. And when I tried to further inject some inf new information, he discounted it completely, 100%, didn't want to hear it, that he was now in control of the, of the sixth dive, maybe the seventh, and he was angry that we had not gone down and surveyed this particular spot in the southeast corner, and that was never the dive plan, never. Paul and I got some things to iron out that are not pleasant. He and I have got it. We have some things that we have to adjust, but I think they're personal between he and I. He is not very happy with me, and I'm not very happy with him, but we're two people that have to resolve those together. Philippone assigns the next dive to the expedition's project coordinator, Guy Science, and his nephew, August. They are keen and eager, but this is their first time in a submersible. Guy and August receive clear instructions, no sightseeing, no souvenirs. They head out in the direction of the new debris field reported on the earlier dive. But what they find are the skid marks left by the mirrors on previous dives. It becomes more and more evident that the gold is probably still stored somewhere inside I-52. They surface in stormy weather in more ways than one. The last dive is reserved for technical chores, so in effect, the expedition and the treasure hunt are over. We, we, we went to the edges, we took the mesotech and looked all around. We cut through this way and that way. We drove Genya nuts. Driving, we say, do this track leg, do this track leg, do this track leg. He goes, no debris. We say, we must check. We go, we, we go from the sub out along this bearing. We go out this way. So we finally went to the conning tower. And because, uh, and it was a pleasure, even though we were there only for a minute, to see I-52 with my own eyes. Right. To see the flag that Paul had put up, it was a wonderful thing. Jim Philippone has ended up with an IOU from Paul Tidwell for $2 million. And what he has always said he wanted most. It was a great adventure. I met some great people. I saw some great work being done. It was a whole new field for me. I've been sitting in a law office all my life, and I never saw anything like this. It's an adventure that I will remember the rest of my life. I will try somehow to get pictures and film from all the people that have done things here, and I'll probably mount a wall in my uh, den at home and call it the I-52 wall and uh, dwell on that for the rest of my old age. I don't want any part of I-52 unsolved. Uh, I really want to get in there and record the insides and to do a recovery. And there's more personal effects I'd like to recover and return to the families as well. And I'll start preparing for it probably within the next month or so. 
So the expedition ends. For Tidwell, it has brought debt and disappointment. But the story of I-52 now is known. Three miles down, the great submarine remains with her golden cargo still unclaimed. Her loss brought Adolf Hitler just a little closer to final defeat. And Japanese scientists waited in vain for high-tech weapons from Germany. Germany.